Welcome back to Under the Knife. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about the barber and his pole. The history of the barber's pole is as intertwined with the history of barber surgeons as the red and white stripes that adorn it. Barber surgeons were medical practitioners in the medieval and early modern period. They were typically trained through apprenticeships that lasted no longer than seven years. They had no formal education and they were often illiterate. The barber surgeons and surgeons existed separately until 1540 when Henry VIII integrated the two through the establishment of the Barber Surgeons Company. Although united, tensions between the barber surgeons and surgeons persisted until the two eventually split in 1745. Barber surgeons offered a variety of services to their communities, and because of their varying social background and relatively cheap prices, they appealed to a greater number of people. In fact, a person was much more likely to visit a barber surgeon than they were to visit, say, a physician or a surgeon in this period. So what could a barber surgeon do for you? The barber surgeon's tasks range from the mundane, such as picking lice from a person's head, trimming or shaving beards, and cutting hair, to the more complicated, such as extracting teeth, performing minor surgical procedures, and, of course, bloodletting. It's this last service which epitomizes the barber's pole. Barber surgeons, like other craftsmen, knew that they needed to advertise their services. At first, they would put these congealed bowls of blood in the window, sort of as a reminder to the passerbys that they might have to come in for their annual bloodletting, much like the way that your dentist sends you a card every six months with the grinning toothbrush. In 1307, the people of London decided that they had had enough of the barber surgeon's bowls of congealed, putrid blood. A law was passed that stated, no barber shall be so bold or so hardy as to put blood in their windows. How should they dispose of the unwanted bodily fluids, the barbers asked? They should have it, quote, carried onto the Thames and thrown into the river. There, much better. The barber surgeons still needed a way to advertise their services, so they came up with a completely different way to do so. The barber's pole quickly became the symbol of the barber surgeon's proficiency as bloodletters, and of course is still used today as a promotional tool, albeit one that advertises slightly different services. The barber's pole originated from the rod that the patient gripped to make his veins bulge, thus making them easier to slice open. A brass ball at the top symbolized the basin that collected the blood, the pole's red and white stripes represent the bloodied bandages, which would be washed and hung to dry on the rod outside the shop. The bandages would twist in the wind, forming the familiar spiral pattern we see on the barber poles of today. In 1540, a statute was passed that required barbers and surgeons to distinguish their services by the color of their poles. From that point forward, surgeons used red and white poles, while barbers used blue and white poles. And in the United States, you can find red, white, and blue poles. Some interpretations say that the red represents arterial blood, the blue represents venous blood, and the white represents the bandages. Spinning barber poles are meant to move in the direction that makes the red, arterial blood, appear as if it is flowing downwards as it does in the body. Although bloodletting seems barbaric to us, people in the past often requested it, kind of like the way that people request antibiotics when they visit their doctor today. Take George Washington, for example. On the morning of December 14, 1799, George Washington awoke, complaining that he couldn't breathe. Fearing his doctor would not arrive in time, the first president of the United States asked the overseer of his slaves to step in and bleed him. The cut was deep, and Washington lost nearly a half a pint of blood. Eventually, the physicians arrived and proceeded to bleed him another four times over the next eight hours. By that evening, the president was dead. One of his physicians later admitted that he thought the blood loss had hastened Washington's death. Yet despite these dangers, people continued to be bled throughout the 19th and even into the early 20th centuries. By that time, however, the barber had traded in his lancet for his pair of scissors, giving rise to the modern day barber shop. Oh, Lindsay. Oh, Lindsay. Oh, Lindsay. Oh, Lindsay. Oh, Lindsay. You're our girl. Well, that's it. Guess it's time to pack up. Calm down, calm down. Oh, I'm gonna be a bucket, a bit of a pawn. I'm in a
Oh, I Foxy, what are you doing? Oh, 